we, some might say, are live. Guess what? It's Thursday night. So that means, some weeks, uh, it's time for Wait! Did I Roll a Wild? Your Marvel Crisis Protocol Pulled Vlog. Uh, we have a couple of great people here tonight. Uh, I am joined by one Mr. Dan Cole, as well as Hi. one Mr. Sir Michael Tisdale of Adeptitis fame. Welcome, Mike. Just sir, just sir will do. Just sir. J not even Sir Tisdale or Sir Michael, just sir? Sir. That'll that'll do. All right. You got it, boss man. Get enough Sir Night Eye. We'll, do, we'll, we'll go with that. Okay. I really appreciate that. So if you uh, are unfamiliar with Mike, Mike is one of the vast team over at Adepticon, as well as um, someone that helped me unbox uh, a handful of boxes for the new uh, set for My Hero Academia which we are starting to get into on this channel as well. If you're into that, it's a part of the Universus system um, made by, uh, Universus is made by Jasco Games, but Jasco Games does the My Hero portion of it. Um, a real quick shout out to Frontline Gaming as they're sponsoring the network and the podcast. So if you are looking for maps, terrain, minis, or more, you can do so at Frontline Gaming using the link in the show notes or in the Twitch chat. All right. So tonight we're going to be going over a bunch of things about running events. We are kind of, Halfway through the year, we're about to enter the second half of the year for cons. The, the handful of huge ones have already happened, including Adepticon in March. And throughout the rest of the year, we have Everwinter, NashCon, Warfare Weekend, uh, Second Wind, Nova. Just There's pretty much something every month between here and year's end. Um, so to just put a little bit more context into actually what it takes to run um, one of these events at a con or run a con itself, uh, Mike is an incredibly experienced person seeing um, kind of the event and con experience uh, at multiple different levels and has a lot of actually very unique insight into kind of how a lot of that ends up being formatted. But before we get into the, the, the main meat, the horseshoe, if you will, of the episode, the first thing that I would like to go over is, uh, you know, the old uh, good old game played, games played and hobby thoughts. Dan is so lost at the horseshoe reference. It's kind of fantastic. It is a yeah, uh, completely. Is it a delicacy amongst all of Illinois, or just in particular areas of Illinois? As far as I know, it's just Central Illinois. And and for those that might not be aware, what is a horseshoe? It is uh, an incredible delicacy. It is usually some sort of Texas toast with some sort of fried chicken or. A uh, hamburger patty on top, then you put a layer of fries, and then you cover the whole thing with cheese sauce, then you eat it, and you go to sleep for about 6 to 12 hours. Mm -hmm. um, right, you had me a cheese sauce. Oh, it's just, it's caked with cheese sauce. It's ridiculous. Um, it, I, so nice. we got into that conversation initially talking about the garbage plates out of Rochester, uh, which oh, know, yeah. just has it a bunch so of stuff good. on it. And a horseshoe is very much like a garbage plate without all of the extra junk on there, honestly. It has the, the fundamentals of some thick toast, some either beef or chicken, and then uh, some cheese sauce and fries. And those are honestly what I'm there for. Everything else is just ancillary. So It's a diet version sure. of a garbage plate. Yes. I don't, I don't know <laughs> if those are words that really should be said, but yes, that is you know technically accurate. Uh, while missing a lot, most of it is roughage. So it's, you know... <laughs> Get all those onions out of here. I don't need all of that simple sugar, you know, clogging up my calorie counter. But right, you're gonna get that from the onions. Uh -huh. Listen, it's made of sugar, Dan. That if you remove the onions, <laughs> you remove sugar. It's a net gain. That is true. But as far as uh, well, hobby, something tells me Dan doesn't believe you. <laughs> if he said technically true, honestly, he's pretty much a scientist. So I'll, I'll take it. That's that's, <laughs> that's a win. But as far as uh, hobby stuff that y'all have hobbied this week, is there anything that you have hobby wrought or hobby brought to the hobby table? Yo, I've got hobby and games, like more than one to talk about. Crazy. All right. Well, go for it. Shoot the whoop. That's a lot for me, right? Uh, so this past Monday, I was on Hobby Hangout with Taylor. It was oh, awesome. Yeah. It was super fun. Right here. Uh, he does every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Um, and I was able to join him this week, and I got two hours of work done on Gwenpool, which got her to very much tabletop standard and a little beyond. I just want to do a little bit more with her. But it was I, nice to – I was like, I'm just going to focus on one model the whole time, which is not how I usually paint because uh, it's like I do one color, and I want to go to this and that. 
whatever. But um, it, it was it was super fun. It was it's a fantastic model. I mean, it's it's got Jeff. So what else do you want? Gwenpool is probably one of my favorite models to have on the table. I I like her in most affiliations. I love her in Criminal Syndicate, mm. especially under new Modok. She's... Like, really, really enjoy yes. her a lot. Yeah, she seems really solid. One thing I forgot um, and to then mention, for games. Oh, hmm? one, super quick. One thing I forgot to mention, uh, now that you've mentioned the Hobby Hangout, that this is also kind of a unique experience, as this is the first time on Way to Die Roll the Wild, everyone but me has been on the Hobby Hangout. So it's, you know, you guys are part of an um, exclusive club that, you know, some just don't get invited to. I mean, you were early on with just voice. Just chatting with Taylor while he was doing stuff. Oh, that's fair. I, yeah, I did do we're that also a handful supposed of times. To be the first, you were also supposed to be the first painting guest, from what Taylor told mm. me, and you canceled multiple times. I have, I've, I've barely been booked. I can't cancel when I haven't been booked. But <laughs> You did cancel, and I am aware of that. One time I did. That is true. Taylor has been heartbroken since. He doesn't know what he did to upset his PCN <laughs> daddy. There was one time yep. in the regular Taylor. stream chat where you gave him a little bit of guff, and he was like, does Tisdale hate me? And I was like, yeah, probably. <laughs> he's like, do you know what I did? And I was like, when he's over it, he'll talk to you about it. And he got real, <laughs> real worried about it. But, sorry, Dan. Well, what did, You got to play a game this week as well? Yeah, I got to play a game of MCP, and I also got to play a game of Shatterpoint. Oh, dope! Uh, you did a demo, right, at, at BD for uh, which is a Bearded Dragon Games that online. That's the abbreviated version of it. Um, for some Chatterpoint. Yeah, I thought it was going to be a demo, uh, but the guy I was playing against, his name was Ryan. He like he said he read through the rule book and he watched a few videos, um, and he really had a solid idea of what was going on. Um, so we were kind of picking some things up together. Um, I was really impressed when he. I for, uh, Owen Bo-Katan uh, activated and she was able to move one of the Mandalorians that he understood that it was a character in the unit and not the whole unit that got to do a, a jump there. Um, and I was like, all right, so he definitely did some homework here. So it wasn't like a teaching game, which was nice because I was like, I've got two games under my belt. And he's like, well, that's what more than I've got. Uh, it was a good time. He won in two struggles, but it was it, it's still fun. Yeah. Well, dope. And then you and I played a game on Tuesday as well on, uh, oh yeah, the power phase. Yeah, uh, that was a blast. And you got to uh, pilot uh, Gwenpool for the first time. How did that go? Gwenpool with A-Force. She was awesome. Uh, I tried something. I wanted to test her out, so I went really risky and had her move up right up to the middle of the board, turn one, uh, to see how well she could tank uh, attacks from your that flank and she managed to to tank she did tank it and survived and scored a couple points and it was i was pretty impressed with her her uh, um uh this end towards target is that what the attack is called her bazooka yes. attack is awesome only four power for eight dice at range four was great mm -hmm. auto yeah. incinerate like it's so good uh and she, the plot armor too really well just... Like, the rerolls and the plot armor just keep her alive. So I, I think I flung, like, three characters into her round one, and she she did it. I don't she think she it. spent for rerolls in that first volley. No, not a, she didn't need – I think often I rolled skulls anyway that I couldn't reroll. But, yeah, she, she made it without that. I think Shuri might have helped her once or twice with upgrades, but she had access to a fair bit of rerolls over there. But still, it was a nice combo. Uh, on that side of the side of the board, those two did work together. Is there any other affiliation uh, it, yeah. that you've been wanting to try her out in outside A Force? Um, I like her with affiliations that give her power because she is a little power hungry. Uh, with this end towards target and um, uh, the the gutter hop, her place. Yes, she wants to be doing all the time, and she re rolls are always good. So like. Uh, want to try her some, I don't know, first thing that comes to mind is Inhumans or Brotherhood to get more power, but uh, Steve Avengers, of course, as always, would be a good one, too, to make her um, superpowers less. She has just the, the one, gutter. right? Yeah, the gutter space. Yeah, it, don't, it would only work on the, on her hop, but still. But still, that is only two that. power, and it's range three. You're pretty much fighter placing yourself around at that point, too. 
again. So she she was really fun, which was nice because she was one that it was like, I'll get the box. There's not characters I really have strong feelings about, but it's like, I like Gwenpool now. She's good. So how about you, Mr. Tisdale? I know you've probably been uh, just running and gunning with uh, some Shatterpoint terrain, right? Or have you had chance to hobby other stuff as well? Uh, just a quick question for Dan. Didn't you get to play She-Hulk twice in that game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that game got uh, off the rails with chat where uh, they... Was it Ben and Alyssa said, "How? what do we have to do to get She-Hulk back on the table after Tim K. Oder? And, and they followed through, so she came back for the last round of the game. Uh, it was pretty hilarious. That I, you know, yep, I, uh, I wasn't expecting that to actually happen, and uh, you know, there's one thing that they have taught me, and it is, if you provide a challenge, they will see that challenge, and in, in pretty much any circumstance. Um, and mm-hmm. real quick, speaking of, uh, just a massive thank you to Ben and Alyssa uh, for helping us out at the Atlantic City Open. Uh, the Married Couple Protocol. Yeah. You can find them on uh, YouTube. Uh, super great people and very good community members as well. So thank you guys. But yeah, sorry, Tisdale, you were saying? No, oh, that's all right. I brought it up. Um, so we have we've been building a ton of Shatterpoint terrain. So I think we have nice. about sixteen tables finished already. For Gen Con, we have base coats down Whoa. on them, and in a couple of weeks, no, about a month. We'll be finishing up the all the work on it, getting them wrapped up, seal coated, and in bins to take over to Gen Con. So we'll have sixteen to twenty tables finished for that time, uh, and then we'll have to finish probably twenty or thirty more for Adepticon. Now, how about games played? Have you been able to actually play anything this week or in recent recent history? You hit up a bunch of My Hero Academia uh, pre-release events at least, right? Oh, that's true. I, I have played some. Uh, I've played in three pre-releases for my hero, uh, and I've won all three of them. So I'm doing great there. But I haven't played a miniatures game in a while. Uh, I'm kind of jonesing for it. I'd like to get back playing some MCP or some Shatterpoint. So yeah. But I did build a Modok Scientist Supreme, and he's primed. All right. So I'm getting ready to paint him. Hey. Sentinel primed or Modok primed? Listen, I'm all about it. Uh, <laughs> but sorcerer, or, ugh, I do that every time. Scientist Supreme Modok might be one of my favorite models. Probably currently my favorite affiliation leader. Um, I, I love him a lot. I love all of the shtick. Higher than Magneto. Better, yes, it is a character that exists in the game that's not Magneto. So chances are he kind of is a peg above at least. Just kidding, that's not true. Um, but yes, I do like him more than. More than uh, Magneto, though Magneto, that uh, hurts. I'm a huge fan of in general. I mean, the the LEDs are always Magneto purple here in the background, um, and uh, you know, I I also think that you know he may have been right. I just don't have the T-shirt to show it. That's all. I have a T-shirt and a water bottle to show it. So I'm a, a fake fan. Officially licensed. Sure. Name three of his songs, Tim. Uh. <laughs> Shred metal, uh, Wolverine, go over there and uh, bow to my will. X Men, welcome to die. That's four. Oh, it was off welcome the album. Welcome to die. It was off the album. Welcome to die. But what's the one that? What's the soundbite that Tisdale always plays when when you join stream? That's what I was trying to remember. I can't. Uh, How does it go? Yeah, I, 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 because I it's been hear. replaced with the All Might one. I still play the Magneto one. What What does it say? You are helpless against my power, X Men. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Come on. Listen, and that man. was disappointing. I'm disappointed in myself for not remembering that one. How much? Like money I could hear it. I could hear sound? the voice. I just couldn't remember the words. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, and I guess that's a kind of a perfect segue um, into kind of one of the main things I wanted to talk about tonight. So. Um, Tisdale, you're part of kind of a, a team or at least a, a group of like-minded people that provide a lot of terrain for a lot of different events, even outside of Adepticon. Adepticon, honestly, and straightforwardly, kind of the gold star as far as number one spectacle and, and a number of other things. But really, 
uh, the quality of the terrain that's put on the table and the abundance of the terrain that's put on the table. I know in, in trying to prepare for other events and, and cons and things like that, it's always kind of a scramble of a lot of sourcing and getting uh, some really kind of poorly put together stuff to have enough stuff on every table. But when asked by somebody, hey, do you have enough for like an Adepticon table though? I'm like, oh geez, I'm like doing math in my head to make sure that there's like possibly enough really high quality stuff to be able to put on a table like that. And it's really kind of at another level. But you guys provide that terrain to kind of a number of places like around you guys, right? Yeah, so we've decided that, and we we started this a couple of years ago, that, you know, we, we the, the terrain team works on this for a very, very long time, and they're an extremely talented group of individuals. So the, the terrain we put on in Adepticon has always been very, very high quality, so that our attendees get to play on cool surfaces with good terrain, good mats, and things like that. But we were having a discussion a few years ago, and it just kind of sits the rest of the year, which is kind of a shame because there are some events that, that struggle a little bit to get that sort of terrain put together. So we've had a couple events reach out and we have uh, supplied terrain for them for Legion, MCP, 40K, Age of Sigmar, um, uh, Shatterpoint going forward. You know, there's a number of game systems we've done that for and um, we're doing it with so this year we're doing it with Gen Con, Nash Con. Is there something in September? I thought there was one in September. Maybe I'm wrong, but there is uh, Second Wind in October. We're doing Warfare Weekend. Um, and I'm probably forgetting some, but they're, they're just kind of regional conventions here that we don't mind helping out, driving our stuff there, and, and making sure that the attendees that go to those events have good terrain and and we can help those events out and take one of the big pressures of running a miniature event off of the minds of those uh organizers that's awesome yeah for real and i mean and, and mike's understating this uh, i think a little bit because the adepticon terrain team like works all year round to get this stuff up and running when you're talking about putting together 16 tables uh in any amount of time let alone a year is is pretty aggressive and especially to the quality that 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 team puts out is is well we got high. 16 done done in two months is what it took us to assemble <laughs> right and build them and, and finish two months and and like i said the the guys that work on the terrain team are incredibly talented and we're very very fortunate to have them come in and do that sort of work and they're all over the country we send some stuff out to those guys and they work on it in their off time and and stuff like that we're like i said we are very very fortunate to have people that are willing to do that sort of work for us uh year round and then to be willing to share that too uh with a bunch of smaller and larger conventions gen con is certainly not a small convention but uh growing conventions like nashcon right that that are they just started this past well, this is year three for them or year two i think uh well, NashCon's been going on a while, but I think this is year two for MCP at NashCon. Um, that's mm. the though. Um, Hank is, and Hank is kind of the de facto leader of AdeptCon, if anybody doesn't know. He has always been about growing a community and, and making sure people have good experiences when they go to events, and that is number one on our priority list. So anything we can do to help out events, we feel it's kind of, you know, something we should be doing to help grow a hobby, to help grow communities, and, and make sh make sure that attendees have good times at these events. And I think that shows pretty heavily when you go to a convention like Adepticon that, that really the emphasis is on the attendee experience. Um, things are, for the most part, well, I mean, not even for the most part, things are incredibly streamlined. Food is accessible and right there. Tables are set up and good to go. Organization and where TOs are is very well placed. Um, it's an incredibly tight and clean ship at Adepticon, um, at least from our experience. And mm. I think that there's a lot of value out there to especially people starting to start their own uh, either conventions or communities or groups or series of, um, of gameplay uh, weekends or tournaments and the like. Uh, and some of the, I guess, what do they call it? 
best practices of, of running an event and what you should be focusing on. So if you had to give advice to someone that is just starting out, they're the, 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 the team champion for MCP or Shatterpoint at their LGS and they're trying to get people involved and into it and they want to start running some bigger and bigger stuff, what are kind of some of the things that should really be in the back of their head as they're first starting out? And then after that, we'll get into when you first have that, uh, you have 16 people finally, you're, you're working on that. What are the next steps that you should really kind of be focusing on as far as either building up terrain or tables or event space or having good TOs and good organizers and other community members and stuff out there? What's the, what's the best path to build, you know, literally just all of that? In my experience, it's when you're starting out, it's very important not to get discouraged. If you have an event that it only gets four or five people, that's still four or five people that came out to play in an event that you're putting on. And it's important not to get discouraged and make sure those four or five people that, ca that come, or even if it's three people, make sure they have a good time and that when they go back to wherever their play group is or, or wherever they're from, that they're like, hey, we went to this this event, this person ran it, and it was a great time. You should come with us next time. And just understand that, that these sort of things don't happen overnight. Um, to build a community where you can get a consistent 16 people for an event is tough. And it's all the organizers out there that have done it have done a great service to their community and, and done a lot of work, to be honest. Um, to provide that much terrain and an experience where people to where people will want to come back and do do that. That's very, very important. Um, all the other stuff is, is pretty, uh, when you're starting out, is pretty self-explanatory. Make sure you have correct mats. Make sure you have some terrain. You know, even, even when you're at that level, you can source terrain from players. Hey, could you bring a table? But make sure it's there. Make sure they're not playing on very sparse tables, uh, things like that. So they have a good experience when they're there. All right, great. And as far as, um, and maybe some people out there don't necessarily know what sourcing tables is, um, which is normally just asking a player base or maybe some attendees if they have a table of terrain uh, to bring it so you can kind of flesh out what's at whatever event site or LGS that you have. Correct. And, oh, go ahead. Oh, go, go for it. Oh, um, so sourcing tables, like, yeah, you either ask uh, attendees or communities out there, hey, I'm running an X person event. I need X number of tables for it. Is there any way I could borrow this for, 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 uh, for my upcoming event? And min the miniatures community is usually pretty great about that sort of thing. I know like the, uh, the Infinity community, Infinity, if you have ever played it, is an incredibly uh, dense, uh, has an incredibly dense terrain requirement. Yeah. So yeah. when these... Uh, Infinity players go to events around the United States, they will usually bring a table or three with them and they will kind of put them all together to have that experience. And I and most miniature gamers are very cool about that. They will lend terrain and stuff like that to anybody that needs it, um, as long as it doesn't come back damaged. And if, it, if something does get damaged, always offer to repair it, paint it, you know, things like that. Make sure that you're taking care of the people who have enabled you to to be able to run the event one thing you can also do that i've had good luck with is sometimes go to store owners and if they have some stock that's been sitting around they may be able to cut you a little bit of a deal mm -hmm. uh if you okay. get the paint it and keep it at the store for play and you're kind of killing two birds with one stone at that point you have new terrain but you also don't have to cart it back and forth places it's now at the store where you play and you're able to utilize it there as well I think that's actually a great tip just from my own personal experience seeing <clears throat> usually what is at a game store is something that either one of the owners or something like that just like is like, hey, you know, we need this. It's just been sitting here. I might as well crack it. I just don't have the time or, or energy to, to, to paint it and put it together. And honestly, just a huge shout out to any uh, LGS store owner that does. 8,000 different things and manages multiple communities and learns all the rules from many systems. Uh, so just a huge shout out to, to those people because they, they provide a massive service to, um, to gaming and, and tabletop uh, as, as a whole. So when you do think about going to like Amazon or something like that or over an LGS, just understand that like 
Amazon is not going to help you build a community and have a, a league night or an open play night or give you a table with a mat and some terrain just ready to go so you can play. Um, so yeah, and even if even if you're you're because I hear it a lot, people talk about how they don't have a local LGS, so they'll order off Amazon. I would always tell those people to explore options like Bearded Dragon. They have an online sales site, mm -hmm. and they usually give some sort of discount, from what I understand, like with your with the professional casual code and stuff like that. PCMA that, 10, 10% 10 off your yeah, orders. Exactly. And you can support a, a local game store that's there to help build a community, even if it's not necessarily yours. And uh, a few weeks ago on the Hobby Hangout, uh, Dallas Kemp uh, from AMG was on, and one of the really cool bits that he was talking about was when he first started getting into mini wargaming uh, and, and just miniatures as a whole, there wasn't a local game store. So it was usually just kind of crashing somebody else's like night that they would play Warhammer or something at their house, and that was like, that was it. But mm -hmm. you build that community on a long enough timeline, eventually an LGS should come around, or you just start your own. But that's, you know, it is a struggle out there. If, if the best you have is meeting at, you know, a church in Nashville uh, because there's no LGS or uh, somebody's basement, somebody's house, somebody's garage. Like, I, I can't tell you how important it is to have those community members that are willing to share their own personal space to allow that type of gaming to happen because it's absolutely vital to the hobby. So, yeah, if you don't have an LGS, just, you know, get a shed. Game shed. <laughs> Get a shed. Call it the game shed. It'll be fine. Like it'll be good. But I actually think that there's a, I think there's an LGS somewhat around here that is that. It's just like a pool barn that someone had. They bought a farm that was there. No LGS around, so they were just set up a bunch of tables and they're like, yeah, every Friday night, just come over. We'll have a bonfire and we'll play some games. And it just kind of grew into its own small community, which just sounds dope as heck, honestly. That sounds awesome. Yeah, that sounds super cool. Um. Now, another thankless uh, member kind of of the con circuit and of game stores and community as a whole is the, the faithful TO, the tournament organizer or tournament official, mm -hmm. depending on, on who you ask. Um, now, at Adepticon, uh, Tisdale, you kind of, I don't know if manage is the correct word, and it probably isn't, but uh, you help facilitate a number of TOs um, to be in the right space at the right time and to make sure that the event goes off and the, the um, attendee has a great experience. Tell me about something you look for in somebody that is a good skill set uh, to be a TO or things that someone could work on if they really wanted to develop um, kind of that role in, in the, the larger community. It's going to sound a bit cliche, but someone who is willing to put in a day of hard work and and understand that there may not be uh, that that satisfaction has to come from understanding that the attendees had a great time because a lot of this stuff is volunteer work. It's it, you know, it is kind of thankless at the end of the day. But if you have people that are willing to say, OK, I'm going to put forth the effort to help grow a community and make sure these attendees have a great experience. That is the most important thing overall. Everything else can pretty much be taught. Um, I At Adepticon, we've been very, very fortunate. The MCP staff at this point is uh, Nate GG of the Gamers Guild, Tim Simpson, Charles Murray, and Brian Watson, and all those guys are extremely hardworking. They're all very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. um, they are able to run, any of those guys could run an event with no problem. And we are actually incredibly fortunate to have four talented team members like that. And kind of a power team, are... to be fair. <laughs> yeah, What's that? Yeah. It's kind of a power team, honestly. I would put that team up against any other any other to staff in in the in the circuit i guess you could say yeah um they are all incredibly talented and they are all when they show up to events willing to work as hard as they can to make sure the attendees have a great experience uh and one of the things that a lot of people don't see is the the teardown afterwards all those guys were there tearing down adepticon at the end until that hall was cleared out because on Sunday that whole hall has to get cleared out. Yeah. 
Um, all that terrain's got to go somewhere. Yeah, it goes back a lot and of totes. loaded on semis, and it's all got to get done that night. And all those guys on that team stayed until the bitter end, um, which is something that's incredibly appreciated. I, I, I cannot state how, how appreciated that is from those yeah. four guys. They were, they were all fantastic. Um, and like I said, Adepticon's very lucky to have people like that. Well, and to just think about, number one, the long day that they have, right? Because they're there before the event starts, so they're there before anyone else. They're there after, you know, finishing and cleaning up and resetting for the next day or staying several hours past to to tear down and stack chairs, tables, terrain, totes, and loading. Like, it's, it's a lot. And this is, uh, honestly, uh, not only is it a sacrifice a lot of times of their time, but they don't get to play, right? They don't get to have as much fun as everyone else. So the fact that there are people out there in the community that are so willing to do that, especially year after year, and to continue to do that, uh, just make sure you thank these people because they, they do a lot to put on a great show, um, and they are there well after everything has, has completed. While everyone else is out having dinner and having a good time, they're doing a a meeting at the end of the day to see how things went. They're correcting problems. They're addressing things. They're creating solutions and making sure that tomorrow is better and brighter and that uh, everything gets back to where it needs to be. It's a it's an incredible job that they do and requires a lot of hard work. Yeah, just to, Tim, Nate, Charles, and Brian would show up about 7.30 when the hall first opened, mm -hmm. 30 minutes before registration would start. And they would be there until 8, 30, 9 o'clock every night on that incredibly forgiving floor that is in that hall. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> they never complained. They were there from setup to tear down. And like I said, those, guys, those four guys gave it their all. And it really showed in the quality of experience we were able to give to the attendees at Adepticon. Um, I have been fortunate enough to go to events that, that Brian Watson has TO'd and also Nate GG and can say that, you know, they they do a heck of a job. I haven't had the opportunity yet to, to go to an event that Tim has run um, or Charles, but it's a, I, I got to say, it's a, it's, a, it's a crack team of very good people that actually care about the game, they care about the community, and, uh, you know, they put in the work to, to make that show, so really appreciate every single one of them. Um, I had a follow-up that I completely forgot, but in lieu of that, I would like to ask you a question. Okay. That question is, the What If event was a great event at Adopticon for MCP as, uh, and, and I'm like oh, literally cool. looking at it. I'm looking right next to me, and actually my... My hands are, if you're watching the video, are going right to the thing I was looking at. Uh, the What If event. This is one of my favorite formats. It was uh, a hyper focus of mine the first year we went to Adepticon because I was yeah. so over the moon with it. Um, we've run uh, a couple ourselves uh, to great fun um, and other cons. And now it's officially on the roster. Is it, was that for Gen Con? Uh, the mm -hmm. What If event? So, I mean... Yep. As far as a, a non-traditional format, number one being just Doper McGopers as a whole, uh, that's official, by the way, the, the official Doper McGopers seal on, on the What If event. But um, this was something, obviously, a, a, a collaboration of, I'm assuming, a handful of people, but I know that you and Hank were, were pretty heavily involved in that. Can you tell me a little about what, had you tried out other formats when you were looking for that Friday format or that Thursday format um, first? And did it lead to what if, or was what if, or that style of format uh, kind of the clear vision from the start? And for those of you unfamiliar, uh, what if is a, a snake draft uh, format where there's only one of every model. Everyone shows up with just crisis and tactics cards. And there is like a fantasy football draft where you have player one picking a model. The first model that they pick that is an affiliation leader is their affiliation leader for the entire event and any character they draft after that will be automatically part of that affiliation not just for making affiliation in their squad but also for tactics cards so a black panther led wakanda list that includes rocket and groot has rocket and groot being able to take advantage of um vibranium shielding 
or Wakanda Forever, for instance. There's a bunch of really neat kind of, not rule breaking, but things that circumvent the standard things that you can do in the game, which makes it very fun and interesting and gives you the ability to find kind of really neat matchups and pairings and combos and stuff that are either just really funny um, or just a ton of fun. So I believe uh, Adepticon was one of the only conventions that got hit twice by COVID. We had to cancel for two years, and it was kind of heartbreaking and very demoralizing um, because so much effort goes in. And during those COVID years, we were ramping up every year to go into Adepticon only to have it kind of canceled, you know, in the, well, in 2020, it was canceled, I think, less than a month out. I was going to say, so I kind of just realized that. Yeah. And then in 20. 21 we didn't i don't think we found out until maybe january we couldn't have it and i think that's when we canceled it i could be wrong on the dates but coming out of that we we wanted and this was the first time mcp was going to be at adepticon so when we sat down and we started putting together a schedule there was nothing out there really for mcp that was uh that was not your standard kind of event um this was before the challenger document so it was kind of like Everyone just brings their 10 models and they play. Hank sat down and he kind of came up with the what if format of let's do a snake draft and then you can kind of put Thanos as the leader of the defenders if you wanted and see what happens, you know, if you paired these models that you normally wouldn't get to pair and benefit from those affiliations. Um, so, so Hank kind of came up with the whole thing and he. I named it because I knew the line of comics. I knew that the What If comic was uh, kind of a cool crossover comic, and I was like, oh, if we just name it this, it kind of fits with the theme and everything, and it, it feels it feels kind of, you know, in, in theme for it. Yeah. It's really comic booky in a good way. Like, mm-hmm. you said, naming it, like, the the name perfectly fits it. I I, I feel like gamers love the whole draft thing anyway, because it's kind of like, I don't know exactly what I'm going to get, but I have an idea. And uh, I just think what if is just, you know, chef's kiss there. It's so good. And it's so on brand, it, for, especially for Marvel with the whole what if idea. Uh, was it like the, the that summer too? The what if show came out as well. So it was like, you know, you nailed it. I thought it was before that. I thought this what if uh, show came out in summer 2020 and we can't or, or no uh, summer 2022 I thought maybe I could be wrong uh, but I I knew the line of comics I didn't I, I still haven't watched the what if show so I, I'm not aware of of that like I know it exists but I've never seen it it did come out uh, that line... following year in, in August so I'm not trying to like to what if at Adepticon's own horn but <laughs> <laughs> but they did it first. We, we were first. You were first. And, Perfect. You know, we'll take massive spoiler. But Thanos Guardians also probably ripped off from MCP instead of uh, the other way around. You right. Know? Yep. And we had, we had uh, so that year we were very shallow on staff too for MCP. Um, we had Tim and we had Charles, and so we ran everything kind of by those two to see what they thought and kind of hashed it all out and put it together uh, ahead of time and kind of just hoped it worked because on paper it looked very, very interesting and we were happy with the rule set, but we were uncertain if it was going to actually come together when the event uh, took off. And, then- and we got nothing but fantastic feedback once, once it went off and people were wanting into it this past year. So we ran two of them this past year. Now, were there any changes or, or early ideas in the, the, the early concept of what if that changed or maybe a different um, mechanic or something that was involved that, it, that no longer is? Any like super so it, deep cut hidden stuff in there? In the first draft, you could draft any number of leaders and change it every turn. So if you were running three leaders on the table, you could say this turn I'm doing uh, – I got Steve on the table, and I'm doing Avengers this turn. Oh, next turn, I'm going to do Brotherhood with Mystique. Um, so you could, you had some options there. We Ooh, quickly realized that sounds that, like a massive headache. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
yeah it, like it, i still think it's cool like yeah. it's it would be a lot of fun to play but it's it would be very confusing every turn to change that so we decided to okay the first leader you draft that's your affiliation and it also prevents people from trying to hate draft a bunch of leaders yeah. everybody kind of gets out at one so i know there's some the people in the community feel that are that play way more than i do that are that are not great and things like that gives everybody a chance to get something that they think is interesting and fun. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Um, I could just see all of the incredibly abundant rules questions of, well, I was playing Mystique turn two and I put my token on this objective, but now I'm playing uh, Midnight Suns for turn three. So does that token go away? And well, everyone was Dark Dimension last turn because Dormammu was my leader, but now are they all Hellfire Club? Right. So I didn't, yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I could see that. Um, I think one of my favorite parts of of this format is when you have it all arrayed out for the draft. When you know at this point we're at like 150, 160 models, something like that, all out with their cards. It just looks. I don't know. It's it's like that's the whole game right there. That's amazing. It looks great. And yeah, it's pick a them cool up and you're like, this is mine now. Uh, what's harder to source? models for what if or terrain for tables to be full for a what if event specifically uh this past year it was models for what if the first year i had every model fully painted um and this past year there were a number of things that happened in my life personally where i kind of dropped the ball and i wasn't able to stay on top of things and we had to source some of the models this year uh but the first year, it was my entire collection, which was kind of cool for me to see out there. It was every model in the game painted at, the, at that time. Um, but hopefully for next year, I will be caught up, and we, will, we'll, we won't have to source any of it. But thankfully, the terrain we, we've done has uh, – that's been easy because we've, we, we make it, and it's not perishable, so it stays good. Um, so – the models were the toughest part this year. And I want to thank you guys because you guys helped us out quite a bit there. So, and that's, uh, speaking of, so that makes me a little disappointed that you might not need to source models next year because I will say it was fantastic to have the Tim France ancient one on a table <laughs> that ended up being on stream. Uh, so that, so I, I, yeah, I could see why um, first year it was so cool to have all of your models out there and be able to be seen because, yeah, watching people play with a couple of my absolute meme models um was uh <laughs> was 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 very heartwarming um but and i think we, that's, can, throw, we can throw a couple of years in there next year right, if you want to bring them I, that uh uh iron fist on rollerblades too is just oh i i just i want so many people to appreciate that model and taylor's uh lisa frank trapper keeper malekith on the rainbow tiger uh <laughs> with a tiger king uh uh, Joe Joe exotic, exotic uh, right. Malekith riding it was just like ah, oh, just perfectly top notch. Did that? Did that end up on stream? I think it did end up on one uh, on stream at one point. I'm not positive, or if it, I think it was in a roster that was on a stream game, but did not get taken, if I recall. Okay. But um, yeah, that was a. Is that a very striking model on camera? It it very much is, um, <laughs> and. I think just as far as stuff out there, so if you are a person or maybe you know someone that's very into MCP that is one of those people that have been playing it from the start, they've collected every model, they have them all painted, uh, what if events are very, very, very incredibly impactful and friendly first-time events for people. They do not, for the most part, need to bring any models mm -hmm. or anything like that. Uh, crisis cards are pretty abundant and they can be printed out. Um, and EMG has released those in PDF form as well, so you can just like get them. Um, and maybe at worst, picking up a uh, the the twenty twenty one cactus card box. Twenty twenty two. It was twenty twenty two. Um, with the update and all the up, it gives you a bunch of character cards as well as a bunch of cactus cards as well. Uh, that's a really solid base. Um, so even having one of those, like, as prize support for what if event, if you're trying to get new players in, is a really, really cool way to do it. Uh, the only thing really required is that one dude that has a ton of models that are painted and ready to go and is willing to share them. And if you've been playing MCP for any amount of time, uh, chances are you may hopefully know someone like that. And if not, 
get your LGS behind it, and they can start running events and build a store set of everything. And that goes a long way into bringing new people in. If you're running What If at a local event, maybe they don't all need to be painted either. That's Adepticon does have a, a convention-wide rule that every model has to be painted, so that's kind of unique to us. But if you're running a local one, maybe maybe not everyone needs painted. So if you have a guy that maybe hasn't painted them all but owns them all, you can still run it. And it doesn't need to be, I guess, every, and to, I guess further jump off of that, it doesn't need to be every model either. Um, Correct. Because yeah. I think uh, year one for the What If event, people had eight models, I think, after the draft, if memory serves. I believe so, yes. Um, yeah, and I think we reduced so many seven this past year. So, I mean, you don't even need seven, you know, ten models per player. I mean, if you're looking to get a handful of people, I think it's a great opener event. I think it's a great soft um, entry into MCP that just show off a bunch of cool stuff because everyone loves powers and affiliation abilities, and this kind of removes some of the restrictions around them. So it's a very easy in for a new player. So I'd highly recommend running a What If. Now, on Adepticon.org, they can find the rules packet for What If if someone did want to run their own, correct? Yeah, all of our rules are out there under event rules. You just search for Marvel Crisis Protocol there. They're all out there. Everything we use at Adepticon rules-wise is there. So whether it's the what if, the affiliation battle, or the doubles, the uh, team-up event, they are all out there, and you can you can use them and run any events you have locally. And if you have any, any suggestions, you can drop Adepticon a line. If you run it and you see something that needs corrected, let us know, and we'll we'll put it into... If it's something we can use, we'll put it into the rule packet for next year. Now, to flip gears yes. just a little bit, um, maybe, you know, so we've talked about what you should kind of maybe be looking at if you're trying to build a community, some events to bring new people in to further build that community. For someone that wants a TO but doesn't feel like they know the rules well enough, I think there's a lot of, maybe not misconceptions, but misplaced anxiety over like, oh my God, I'm going to need to be like, I'm going to need to know every rule. I'm going to know every need, need to know every little thing. Um, in my experience, a lot of what judge calls are end up being, do I actually have line of sight on this? Is this actually within range four? Can you just tell me so we don't bump things around? Um, obviously, there's a lot more involved. But can you demystify a little bit some of the barriers that people might put in their own mind before they want a TO? and some of maybe the worst experiences, best experiences, or common experiences that you've had as a, a TO of, you know, well, quite frankly, some rather large MCP events. I mean, the thing is, no matter how prepared you are, there's going to be a situation come up that you're going to have to bust out the rule book or the, the forums or something to check on. There's a lot of interactions with this game that are kind of unique that you may never see. So know the rule book front and back if you can. It's pretty simple. It's pretty short. Everything else you can kind of make a judgment call off of, and there are some great resources like the rules forums where you can search for certain things. Don't be afraid to say you don't know, but you're going to check. Players will. Players generally have no problem with that if it's a rules call. And I've done it multiple times. You know, uh, we have got obviously guys like Nate, Tim, Charles, and Brian don't have to do that nearly as much because they are so up on the rules. But I've had to look at players and say, give me one second. I'm going to check that. Like, this is what I think, but I'm going to check that. And to be honest, I'm right most of the time. Mm -hmm. My instinct was correct. But the players appreciate it by you just taking the extra minute or two to go confirm that. No players, I've never encountered a player that's going to have a problem with the judge saying, I don't know, let me check for sure. And just a shout out to the rules forums really quick. Uh, Thoris yeah. and Eagle are just doing an incredible job at that. Uh, odds are, if, you're, if you have a rules question about a character that's not been released in the last four minutes, chances are there's a resource there somewhere. Um, and AMG, just very specifically, has done a very good job at breaking down the order of operations about how the turn works and when certain types of effects and uh, categories of effects happen and in what order. Um, that honestly, once I understood that logic behind it of the, well, modifying your opponent's dice is always the last step, or the first step of the cleanup phase is always scoring. So if there's an effect that would move an objective during the cleanup phase, 
It's already been scored. It's not going to affect this. Um, that order of operations, I think, is a really solid highlight that um, a lot of people might not really even notice or appreciate. Um, but in both Shatterpoint and MCP, it is very clear, and it makes it usually very nice so that when a rules call is made, you can go back to that order of operations and be like, oh, yep, you know what, it does happen right here, that makes sense. And you can kind of understand why some of those niche rules do in fact work the way they did, because they've made a very clear framework for it. Yeah, I should have emphasized that a little bit more. You're right on that. I, it is in the, that part is in the rule book, and that is very important to have down, because you can answer 95% of questions based on that. Mm -hmm. If you understand what happens when, you're going to be able to answer a lot of questions. I forget the exact page, but if you're uh, if this is the first time you're hearing that, especially about MCP, in the rule book, there's this list about how the turn order goes and, and when certain effects happen. And it's honestly beautiful <laughs> as far as understanding it, the game. Is it in one of the appendixes in the back? I think it might be, yeah. I, I, think, I, the first, but I, I think the whole list is there. You can go and just kind of memorize it. And once you have that down, like I said, that's 95% of the, the questions you'll get at an event. Mm -hmm. Especially for things like, I think common questions that I see on the forums or, or just on Facebook or, or what have you is like, these both, both of these effects happen at the same time. Which one happens first? And it's a very simple, nice answer a lot of times. It's like, well, if both effects are yours, you choose. Whatever order you want them to happen in. And that's a very nice uh, categorical uh, thing to be able to supply somebody with. It's like, oh, oh. There's usually that realization that afterwards, there. too, where it's like, oh, I can actually do this. This doesn't. This rule actually doesn't limit. It opens up the things I can do with different effects happening at the same time. Um, and it's kind of one of those very nice, like, broad-based, high-ceiling uh, effects with the game as a whole. Now, when you do get to play, which is a rarity, especially for, for someone that, that does, a, you know, a pretty considerable portion for the community, what do you like to play? I mean, come on. There's only one answer. I, yeah, so I knew the answer, but I'm yeah, assuming it's Brotherhood. It's purple. Yeah, or I guess Brotherhood, technically. <laughs> but it's Magneto. Okay, so now, do you ever throw in Mystique as a leader on some uh, some heavy objectives, like some ambush tokens or something, or is it really just Magneto all the time? No, it's just Magneto. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I love about Magneto is that he's got fans, and it's like fans of Magneto are like only fans of Magneto, and I don't think that's a bad thing. <laughs> I don't either. I think it's actually super fitting. As a huge Magneto fan myself, uh, uh, yeah, I agree. Well, I grew up in the, like, I started reading comic books in the 90s. I was a kid in the 90s. So there's so many cool Magneto stories that came out about that time. Yeah, absolutely. His story was just so interesting to me. So growing up in that time where, like, Age of Apocalypse happened and stuff like that, where he became the leader of the X-Men. And you could tell that while he is a villain, he's not a traditional villain. There were, there, he's a deeply layered character yes uh, it was very very interesting and i enjoyed reading about him and learning about him and i just putting him on the table in mcp he's i know this is probably going to trigger some people but i don't think dr feels... d's listening you've already mentioned infinity and i meant to mention this before uh <laughs> when you mentioned infinity but uh part of the network um uh, dylan dyer dr d does an infinity podcast called arachne uh, that's actually did an episode very recently about event running, uh, which inspired trying to do this episode. Uh, and when Tisdale was mentioning that they have very dense terrain game boards, they do. I checked out the Infinity event at Ironweld this year, and I got to say the community and the vibe in the Infinity room is very similar to MCP and very mm. different than a lot of the other rooms at a lot of these conventions where particular very competitive games lead to 
very competitive, not super fun and jovial rooms to walk into. And Infinity has a vibe very similar to MCP, where people are laughing, their stuff is painted gorgeously, it's a smaller model game, so you can spend more time on the characters you care about, and the terrain, honestly, just looks rad as heck. It looks like a 90s yeah. like roller skate rink, as far as like <laughs> just neons and colors all over the place. I, re I really dug it, so just, sorry, quick aside. Oh no, I... Like I said, this may trigger some people, but I believe Magneto is one of the most, I think he's one of the most points balanced for what he is in the comics characters in the game. He is an extremely powerful character, and he's a six point character, and he's, a, he's an omega level threat, but he's, you know, he's vulnerable in the game, but he is incredibly powerful when you put him on the table. So it really, he really kind of feels in theme when you play him. Uh, in MCP. I don't really disagree with that. And very similarly, Magneto know. as a whole and his writing in the 90s and early 2000s X-Men comics like developed the characters that I look for in media, whether it's books, TV, movies, comics, what have you, where because Magneto is such a layered character that you can identify with in some aspects but can't condone in others, um, if there's just a villain out there that's just bad to be bad, like I get just bored out of my mind. I like I need morally gray villains and to the lesser extent morally gray heroes, just because you know, at the end of the day, everyone's human unless you're you know a mutant or whatever. But like I don't know, there needs to be more Captain America or Captain America. He's uh, not morally gray. Uh he's not. Okay. Listen, we're at, we're at minute 56. There's simply not time. But at another <laughs> point, uh, I will go down a slope. I don't think I'm going to be able to convince you in any way, shape, or form, but I have been able to convince weaker-minded people before. Um, but, yeah, I, I think uh, the way Magneto has been done leads to incredible has, – has made me really appreciate really well scripted and created and written. Uh, and I even hesitate to say even the word villain. Because uh, they're they're just a differencing of opinions with a different state of the game, um, and I think that especially in a lot of the what if stuff or alternate universe stuff, like you see Magneto doing what he would have done, but in a different light with a different sec set of circumstances, it comes out in a very different way, and those are the the stories that I really 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 enjoy. It's like oh, but what if these two things had gone right for him? And it, you know, completely changed the narrative. I, I just really dig that stuff. But I think Magneto and Brotherhood in general was something I played a lot of when they first came out. And it's a mm -hmm. it's a target rich environment out there if you're a big Marvel fan as far as like affiliations to play, characters to play. Never would have thought we would have had a Gwenpool, um, who I just am over the moon with in general. Uh, it's it, same with uh, Modok. Didn't didn't understand how much I was going to dig Modoc in game, especially with Scientist Supreme, and to give me an appre appreciation retroactively for Modoc in the comics and some of the other media as well. Um, yeah. If you've ever been a comics fan, and even if you aren't a comics fan, I did a, a training or a demo game with someone a couple weeks ago. They were like, I've seen MCP. I've seen, you know, that people are playing it and stuff. I I'm just not comic book people, so I don't care. Gave them a demo game anyway, and they're like, yeah, I still don't care about comics, but like, I really but this like, game. I really like drawing terrain and people, like. So did you let him play Magneto? Everybody does. I didn't. So they they you know they very specifically <laughs> were like I was like what? Type I don't know of... if you know this, but he throws terrain real well. That's that's very true. He doesn't throw people though. He doesn't give the full experience. Once he KOs him, he throws him off the table. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> But they were very much into street level characters. They were like, well, oh, I didn't know you could do that. I can play characters like Luke Cage or Daredevil, uh, Punisher um, against, you know, Magneto or Spider-Man or the Avengers or the Hulk. And it's like, yeah, and it's viable. There's really not, that's not much that's not viable in this game. Outside of Apocalypse, one of my, one of my only big wishes for MCP to, that I want to see is a Daredevil leader for defenders so i can play the defender yeah. street level version absolutely mm -hmm. 
and even when you're saying there are very few things that aren't viable, like really it's only they're not viable at the highest competitive levels. Like I think everybody's viable at, in casual play. Savage, I'm so glad you're in chat right now because I was about to mention specifically you, and then just like a beacon of light, you came out of the the darkness. Um, unaffiliated, even being rather viable. So at ACL, uh, Andrew Savage was running. He's like, you know what? I want to be one of the top players for unaffiliated. If it's a category on long shanks, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> and when you can just play any character unrestricted. I think I was talking to him at one point, and he was like, yeah, it's weird to just be able to play whoever I want. That actually makes it harder, because now I have to narrow it down between characters that I think that can perform and characters that I just never get to play, so I want to play. Mm -hmm. um, and unaffiliated is, in fact, viable in a lot of situations. Uh, really, all you're losing at the end of the day is maybe a tactics card or two and the affiliation ability, and quite frankly, some of them out there, there's great characters with subpar affiliation abilities where you probably weren't going to use the affiliation ability anyway. Just full send it. True. And that's the cool thing about being able to splash characters in affiliation in this game is that uh, there's really, like, Winter Guard can have a Hulk in it. Winter Guard can have a Malekith. Uh, Midnight Suns, even though it's underwhelming at times, could, you know, throw a Magneto in if they really wanted to and, and Midnight Suns <laughs> hop them around. Heck, if it's one if, you know what I mean? Just sounds really good. Right? <laughs> um, and I think that's one of the things that is very um, appealing about MCP as a whole is compared to other, like, you know, just to throw it out there, like Warhammer, right? If you're not playing uh, your your particular army with battle line, with all of the things that makes that army even be able to be on the board, you, you cannot throw Tyranids with some Sigmarines with a dark eldar and a uh, a knight in the back you just can't do it that is in fact viable in mcp and that's once again official stamp go for mcgobri mm. all right so yeah if you want to play if you want to play punisher and cyclops and daredevil on the same team feel free that's very valid very valid i love cyclops so much um cyclops is valid come on tim wow the fact that <laughs> High evolution. So here's the thing, and maybe you'll appreciate this. I'm gonna oh, bring this snap, around. Man. I'm gonna turn you around on this bad boy. All right. Never, never cared about Cyclops. Surprising you didn't either, because he's a Boy Scout and you like that that type. But the thing that really brought me around on Cyclops was Avengers versus X Men, where he was like, you know what? Chuck was wrong, and Magneto was probably right, but he went about it the wrong way and kind of blended those two paths and was significantly more Magneto leading. It was like, yeah, this is the correct, yep, this was right. Both of you, this, yep, you just should have uh, blended it up in a smoothie together. You would have been fine. The big problem with Cyclops is generally his writing. It's kind of boring yes. a lot of times. Um, but when he's done right, he's a very, very interesting character. In X-Men versus yeah. Avengers, he really was. And right after, too, that just whole, like, sl not sleeper cell, but, like, hidden X-Men group teleporting around trying to find new mutants before the X-Men could recruit them was just this awesome like cat and mouse play with two people once yeah. again that are both good uh, but maybe morally ambiguous sometimes both going for different but the same goal and I just I love that type of storytelling but, and we got gold balls out of that run <sighs> yeah we did yes we did oh what's he called now the egg egg uh, how here's the thing <laughs> I Gold Ball's a way better name. I, yeah, that's I, I bet way, 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 somewhere at Marvel, there was this pool. It's like, all right, but like, Gold Balls is the worst name, right? That name couldn't be made any worse. And then one dude was just like, I can do better than that. I can do better <laughs> than that. I can make that character have an even worse name than he already does. But they did it. They figured it out. They, they, yay, they did it. But I think, unless you have anything else to go out on, Mr. Tisdale or Mr. Dan, don't get eliminated. That's actually great advice. <laughs> <laughs> but that, to top that, one. That, that will bring us to a close today. As always, uh, if you're watching the show live, this is your last opportunity. Tomorrow also might be your last opportunity, some might say, to enter our Shatterpoint core box giveaway. Not only is this a core box, it's my personal core box that I pre-ordered using code PCME10 at checkout at beardedragongames.online. Um, it, it's, it's my own set, and I, I'm giving it away. 
So head over to professionalcasual.com, sign up for that, and it's free to enter. You can enter a multiple amount of times as well. It's beautiful. Thank you, Dan. Um, and uh, that ends tomorrow. At the end of the month, we'll do the drawing July 1st, uh, and we will ship that out to whoever ends up winning that. Next month, and actually, if you head over to professionalcasual.com, next month's giveaway is already up. It is for the Padawan Ahsoka model. That was a bonus if you were one within one of the hand, first handful of people to, to pre-order the, the core box. Giving away that as well. That'll be July's giveaway. So you'll be able to sign up for that in the same place you signed up for this current one. It'll be a different link. But if you head to professionalcasual.com slash one Ahsoka, please, you'll be able to sign up for the Padawan Ahsoka giveaway. In addition the to all that... The, the Discord is free to join. We would love to have you there. Hang out with us. We do a number of things across the network, including Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, actual plays, and a grim podcast, A Perilous Adventure, and Settling the Southlands, which is on the Patreon. We also have Pathfinder 2nd Edition, actual play podcast, and the Lost Omens podcast, as well as The Slithering, which is on the Patreon. And Comic Book Rundown with Joe Gennaro and Ron Haynes. They dive into comic books from this year and before. Uh, Marvel, DC, Image, Indie, things from all over the place, and they go through mm -hmm. issue by issue, usually doing small arcs, encapsulating the whole story. I defy you to check out the comic book rundown and find some comic that you aren't interested in and haven't gotten around to yet. We also have Arachne, Mondays. Dr. D, it's an Infinity podcast, another minis game. Uh, Dr. D is incredibly... Um, talented with words. Big Magneto. A huge Magneto fan. Incredibly talented with words as well, specifically in ones that make me personally laugh. So I have not had more fun listening to a podcast about a game I don't play than in Arachne, um, as well as Dr. D's blogs over at professionalcasual.com where he teaches you how to paint better and to set reasonable goals uh, that you can achieve both in play, in running events, and in painting as a whole. So if you are into the Worthy, AMG's painting competition that happens only at Adepticon. Uh, it is all about being on your own path and improving yourself, not anyone else, year after year as you go back to it. And Dr. D has written some great articles about starting that path and getting on it and making it manageable. So I'd highly recommend checking those out. Uh, in addition to all that, professionalcasual.com. You can get podcasts a week early over at the Patreon, patreon.com slash professionalcasual. A massive thank you to our King Dean Doppeldongers and our professional cake sitters, including but not limited to uh, Mr. Tisdale, Charles, uh, X Paxis, Rob, Devil Pup, Dagna, Bicon. It's been a hot minute since I've done this. Otis, Leroy, uh, Iron Biker Maze, drinker. Wizard Skills, Whiskey Chugger. Um, who else? That's 12. Who else I got? I said Otis, right? Anthony. Oh, Tony Hot Hands. I think there's one more. And that is viewers like you. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> we stream every day here on Twitch. Hobby Hangout Monday. Then I play games Tuesday through Friday. We also do live Marvel Crisis Protocol and Shatterpoint, usually Tuesday nights, as well as this right here. Wait till I roll wild. Do you want to check it out live? Well, guess what? It's Thursday nights, 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much to Tisdale for joining us this evening and Dan as well. Um, and we hope to see you at the next Adepticon showing up to see if Tim France, the Ancient One, will be in the What If draft. Guys, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Love you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.